Today, we are taking a look at the 1812 Overture. There was wow. no brass band. Man, what a letdown. A lot of noise going on, that's for sure. The Royal Albert Hall is really, really pretty. Here we go, Cairo. Hello, everybody. Beethoven here says, hey. So this past week, we've been parked in 1812. I figure there's nothing more fitting for Music Sunday than to take a look at the 1812 Overture. A lot of you have mentioned it in the comments on my last two or three Napoleon videos. And I think before I started doing these videos, I actually didn't know who wrote the 1812 Overture. Of course, I've heard it before, and it's a very famous piece, but I never really thought about who wrote it exactly. So this is going to be a brand new composer today, Tchaikovsky. We really haven't done anything on him previously before. Howard Goodall's music series hasn't really touched on him much other than just a really couple of quick mentions. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch a very short documentary on the 1812 Overture and kind of learn the background behind it. And then we're going to listen to part of the 1812 Overture, the more famous part of it with the cannons and all of that stuff. All I know about the 1812 Overture is kind of what you guys have told me in the comments that this was written to go along with Napoleon's, was it his retreat from Moscow? or his invasion of Russia. I'm not really sure. I think this video is probably going to uh, fill us in on a lot of those details. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, a Russian composer born in 1840, was a part of the romantic period of classical music composers. One of Tchaikovsky's most well-known pieces has some explosive instrumentation. That's right, I'm talking about the 1812 Overture, which calls for Cannons. No, not that cannon. These cannons. So what could possibly compel Tchaikovsky to compose an overture that includes military artillery? Well, the military. Let's rewind a bit. In the summer of 1812, Napoleon and an estimated 680,000 French soldiers invaded Russia. After weeks of fighting, the French army attacks the retreating Russian army at Borodino, about 120 kilometers west of Moscow. Borodino is one of the largest and bloodiest battles of the Napoleonic Wars, with 250,000 soldiers on the battlefield and 70,000 casualties. It ends up being another it's victory crazy. for Napoleon, and one week later, his army is marching into Moscow, ready to claim victory from the Russians. The Russian army had no intentions of surrendering to Napoleon at Moscow. Instead, to deny the French army resources and shelter for the coming winter, the retreating Russian army sets fire to the city. Most of Moscow's 270,000 inhabitants had evacuated the city a month before, Special knowing that Napoleon's here. army was on its way. Based on this survey from the time, an estimated 75% of the city is destroyed or damaged by the fires. Okay, so areas shaded dark were destroyed or damaged by the fires, so pretty much the entire city, just like the outskirts are not damaged and there's like a little section in the middle there that's not damaged either. Interesting. I suppose Moscow at this point was probably a little bit smaller than it is now. I would imagine maybe quite a bit smaller. This looks small on the map. It looks like a kind of a smaller city to me. You know, I guess thinking about it in the scope that um, Moscow is like how big it is now, that would seem like a lot but I don't know, you guys let me know. How much bigger is Moscow currently than it was back in this time? But still, that's a lot of damage, I mean. Leaving Napoleon's army cold and alone and no closer to victory. With supplies dwindling and winter setting in, Napoleon retreats from Russia and by December 14th, 1812, he was no longer in Russian territory. And only you know, it was actually really brilliant of the Russians to do this. Like, their whole strategy, it seemed like, was just to deprive the French of the supplies they needed in order to stay in Russia and take Russia. Yeah, I don't, I think, like, this video is making, like, the really quick overview of it right here is making me kind of realize just how brilliant that actually was. Even though I know that that's, like, a common tactic that's, that's used, but still, it's kind of like... The Russians figured out how to, to beat Napoleon. And by December 14th, 1812, he was no longer in Russian territory, and only a fraction of his original army survives the invasion. To commemorate the victory, Tsar Alexander I commissions the construction of a cathedral to Christ the Savior, to signify our gratitude to divine providence for saving Russia from the doom that overshadowed her. Fast forward 68 years. It is now 1880. 
The cathedral is nearing completion, and a mentor of Tchaikovsky suggests he write a festival piece to be played at the opening of the cathedral, which is planned to take place in 1882, during the All-Russia Arts and Industry Exhibition. Tchaikovsky likes the idea, and starts writing the piece in October of 1880. Just okay, six... so we're 68 years on, and they haven't even finished the temple yet. Interesting. It's taking a long time to build that. Tchaikovsky likes the idea, and starts writing the piece in October of 1880. Just six weeks later, Tchaikovsky has finished writing the overture. The six overture's weeks. structure can best be described as narrative, since the music follows the events of the French invasion of Russia in 1812. The overture begins with a simple melody from an Eastern Orthodox hymn, O Lord, Save Thy People. This represents the Russian people praying for a swift conclusion to the invasion. Then, the melody from the French national anthem, Le Marseillaise, can be heard, which represents the invading French army. A quick side note here about Le Marseillaise. At the time of the invasion, the French national anthem was not Le Marseillaise. Napoleon had replaced it with a different anthem. It was not until 1879 that La Marseillaise was officially reinstated as the French national anthem. However, since audiences would be more familiar with La Marseillaise, Tchaikovsky decided to use it to represent Napoleon's army, even though it was not Napoleon's official anthem. The melody of La Marseillaise is heard competing against other Russian folk melodies. This represents the two armies fighting in battle as the French army gets closer and closer to Moscow. Then. We hear five cannon shots, which represent the Battle of Borodino. At this point, the oh. melody of La Marseillaise is at its most prominent and seems to be winning. The next element we hear is a long descending run. And I mean, this goes on for quite some time. This descending figure represents the French army's retreat out of Moscow and Russia. Oh. At the end of this long run, the melody from the hymn we heard at the very beginning of the piece returns. This can be interpreted as prayers being answered or divine intervention. This time, the melody is not apprehensive, it is triumphant, with church bells pealing and chimes ringing in celebration. For the grand finale, we hear 11 more cannon shots and the melody of God Save the Tsar. With a completed work. score in hand, Tchaikovsky was ready for the All-Russia Arts and Industry Exhibition in 1882. The event was going to mark the 70th anniversary of the victory over the French. Even the current Tsar Alexander II was to be in attendance. Organizers planned to set up a raised stage in front of the cathedral for the orchestra. They planned to have a brass band perform with the orchestra. And all the church bells in all of Moscow were to play the celebratory pealing near the end of wow. the overture. And of course, the cannons would be there. Unfortunately, History was not on Tchaikovsky's side. In March of 1881, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated, and planning for the exhibition was significantly scaled back. The overture wow. did premiere at the exhibition in Moscow on August 20th, 1882, but it was not conducted by Tchaikovsky. There was no stage next to the finished cathedral as planned. It was performed in a tent next to the still unfinished cathedral. There was wow. no brass band. There were no cannons. However, Tchaikovsky did conduct the overture in 1891 at the dedication of Carnegie Hall in New York City. Really? But Tchaikovsky was not a big fan of the piece. He wrote that the overture was very loud and noisy and completely <laughs> without artistic merit. Obviously written without warmth or love. The 1812 mm. overture ended up being one of his most popular works and continues to be performed all around the world. Okay, so that was a really, really interesting documentary. I like how they took the sheet music and they broke down the different sections of the overture and explained what they were. Uh, that's also super sad that Tchaikovsky did not get the opportunity to perform this the way that he wanted to or conducted, I guess. Yeah, that must have been horribly, like, I guess demoralizing to um, be stuck in a tent playing this when you were gonna have like the big grand stage and the cannons and the brass band and everything. Man, what a letdown, I guess. But that's also super interesting that the opening of Carnegie Hall was going to be the 1812 overture. 
has nothing to do with America or the United States, so that's kind of a weird uh, choice, I think, for a piece. And maybe just the, the grandioseness of it, that's what made them choose that, I don't know. Now, I wanted to do a live version of this instead of just kind of passively listening to audio only. I really enjoy watching the musicians play the piece. It just brings it more to life, I think. So really the best option I could find, there are a lot of live versions of this. Most of them are just really quick, like two or three minute segments of the 1812 Overture. This one, I think, has really good audio quality and they really get in and show the, the musicians. So the one that we're going to watch was actually performed at the Royal Albert Hall in the UK. It was conducted by Mark Elder, and I know that they're going to have pyro uh, go off instead of actual cannons. There was another performance at the Royal Albert Hall that had actual cannons kind of around the top, but the video quality on those was not great and they only showed part of it. So we're gonna just kind of do the whole thing here and we'll have to settle for pyro for the cannons. So hope you don't mind. So all in all, this is gonna be about 15 minutes. Part one's a little over eight minutes, part two's a little over six minutes. So I guess 15 or 16 minutes total for the 1812 Overture. So let's go ahead and and let's listen to this. I'm really excited, especially after learning kind of the breakdown of it and everything. People standing in the audience. the church hymn part. here to sound like a church organ almost. Bases are big instruments. It 
This is the French national anthem, right? the French National Anthem. I thought it was starting that section, but I don't think so. This doesn't sound right. That's the first one. Those other Russian ballads, right? That it's kind of mixed in with. Because this sounds Russian. It looks funny playing that with the lip action there.
this little part means it, it always follows up the more intense music. Is this a break in the fighting? Or... I'm not sure if they mentioned it in the last video that we watched. That's for sure. This is the most famous part of the 1812 Overture that you always hear. Flashpots. leave this video I just wanted to like go back a little bit here so like this pyro this is stuff that uh, I used to do in theater and I might still do it if the opportunity comes up but the proximate pyrotechnics like this this is my favorite type of pyrotechnics to do I have done the big fireworks out you know in in the open you know the real big fireworks that you usually see that's okay but 
the more fun stuff is, the more proximate stuff that you do, like in theater and shows like this. It's just, it's a lot more fun to kind of set up and do because you have to time it, you know, with the music and it feels more like a performance than you're just shooting off big fireworks. So I really love this stuff right here. And then these little flash pots that go off, they, they must have had those like mic'd up because they make a little, a little bit of a bang, but they don't usually sound that loud. <laughs> they must have had a microphone like right on those. But yeah, these little flash pots right here. I don't know why I'm giving you a, a little pyro spiel because I don't know, I, I get excited about it. I love pyro doing it. When you set this stuff up, you have to like make sure that it's like 15 to 20, at least here in the States. I think the regulations are at least 15 feet away from audience, which it looks like it's about like that um, with these people on the side here. The performers can be closer to it. So what I would do is I would like set the pyro up, you know, rig it up. I would also design how to wire it too because you have to wire it a certain way to the board that sets it off. And then you can program the computer as well to kind of like automatically do it for you but for a show like this i would just manually push the button at the point in the music where i was supposed to fire off the pyro a lot of fun okay well that is the 1812 overture i actually enjoyed that a lot more than i thought i was going to because i know the story behind it I think a lot of people who listen to it perhaps don't really understand what it's about or the story behind it. In the past when I've heard the 1812 Overture, literally I had no idea what it was about. I was like, okay, I guess it's about something that happened in 1812, but I don't know what that is. In some weird way, you know, being American, I associated it with the War of 1812. Again, I didn't know that a Russian wrote it. I didn't really know much about the Napoleonic Wars at all. I didn't know when they happened. So it was just really this abstract thing that I never really took the time to look into. You know, what what are they referring to in 1812? What is this about? It makes a huge difference listening to this when you have the background behind it. I would not have appreciated it nearly as much if I had not gone through and learned about the different battles in Napoleon's invasion of Russia. So I am so glad that I waited to do this until we had gone through that. And I think we still have maybe one more video left to do about Napoleon in Russia after his retreat from Moscow. He was still in Russia at that point. So yeah, I think that if you are going to go to a performance of this or if you, um, you know, want to listen to it, it would be a huge, huge help to know the background of this particular piece. I don't think you need to do that for all classical music, but because this one is so narrative and it's very, very specific to very specific historical events, It'll just mean so much more to you. You'll get so much more out of it if you have studied a little bit of the Napoleonic Wars and the events leading up to this 1812 overture. I also thought that the background of it, you know, how he came to write it and perform it eventually was really interesting as well. And it's interesting that Tchaikovsky did not really enjoy this particular piece himself. You know, he said that he thought it lacked a lot of emotion and love, and he thought that it was just mostly a lot, a lot of noise not really his best piece, but it's also one of his most famous. I think he also wrote The Nutcracker as well, right? So I would say that probably The Nutcracker and 1812 Overture are his most famous works. At least as far as I know, you guys can let me know down in the comments if there's one that I'm leaving out. But let me know what you guys thought about the 1812 Overture. I thought it was so great that we could do this and have it go along with the other Napoleon videos that I'm watching and just let it tie into history. So and it also happens to fall in the romantic era that we've been learning about in the previous videos on Music Sundays with Howard Goodall. So just like the, the perfect piece for today, I think. So we're gonna wrap it up there. Just to let you know, I do have some social media that you can follow me on if you would like to get more of a behind the scenes look, perhaps, at, you know, this channel. Maybe a few other things going on in my life that I'll share with you. Also make sure that you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I try to reserve Sundays for music and just learning about music, although, the past few weeks has been hard to get them out on Sunday and last week I missed it because it was Easter and I just had a ton of stuff going on but we're back at it today. So we're gonna get back next week into how we're good all and I think we have one more video left in that series before we're done with it so make sure that you come back for that and uh, Beethoven and I will see you next time.